Hello and welcome to Baseball Barbacast, the only baseball podcast in the world that had a better winter than the Los Angeles Dodgers. I'm Jake Mintz. That's Jordan Schusterman. Self-care is very important. Oh, it's so true. And um, I would say budget-wise, too. Uh, did you do any uh, deferring of payments uh, to for future purposes like the Los Angeles Dodgers did? I don't know if I did, but I would say that like on a per dollar basis, I had an even better winter than the Dodgers did because they spent a couple more bucks than I did. Yeah, but I have a feeling they've also already made more money <laughs> even before <laughs> the games have begun <laughs> since we uh, since we well, whatever we've made this this past winter. But Jake, it is indeed time to preview the Los Angeles Dodgers at the end of this podcast, because we are going from worst to first. This is our National League West preview. We did the AL East on Monday. Hopefully you guys check that out uh, on YouTube or wherever you listen to your podcasts. Uh, but yeah, we're, we're doing NL West. The, the order we're doing is, is kind of all over the place, but I think that's fun. There, there's no uh, prescribed order here. And uh, the longer we, I have to wait to talk about Mookie Betts playing shortstop, I am not going to be happy. So I'm very excited to be doing this NL West preview today. Let's jump right into it. If we talk about the Colorado Rockies for more than eight minutes, our contract with Yahoo is officially void. So let's try and do our best here, Jordan Schusterman. How did the Rockies do last year? Poorly. What did they do in the offseason? Practically nothing. Who's on their team? I'll go through it. Uh, Elias Diaz is their catcher. Chris Bryant is going to play first base, it seems. Brendan Rogers, former top pick, number three overall, is at second. Ryan McMahon at third. Ezekiel Tovar at short. The outfield is Gold Glover, Brenton Doyle, and center. He is flanked by Nolan Jones, breakout star from last season in left. And right field is going to be like Sean Bouchard and Sam Hilliard and whomever feels like going out there. Charlie Blackman is still a Rocky. He is going to be the designated hitter. The pitching rotation, the gentleman. Uh, signed up to give up just a heap of runs this season is Kyle Freeland, Cal Quantrill, Austin Gomber, Ryan Feltner, and Dakota Hudson. Uh, the bullpen has people in it. Um, the one big question about the Colorado Rockies, is this enterprise any different from a year ago? Is there any reason to feel better about the Rockies as a team that tries to win baseball games? Here's what I think stands out about the Rockies both last year and going into this year. This is a team, a franchise, an organization that has lacked direction in a very severe way for a while now. However, they sunk to new lows uh, in 2023. It was a franchise worse, 103 losses. I know they haven't been around for that long, but that's that's a lot of losses. And now coming into this year, all the projection systems will tell you this is the worst team in baseball. Now, I don't know if I actually believe they're going to end up with the worst record in baseball, though you could certainly make a case for it because the, <laughs> the the problem is it's like, oh, how do you pitch in cores? That's true. It is a challenge. However, the just the talent on the mound has regressed to such a troubling level and the pitchers that were good have gotten injured to the point where now it's like, well, I can't even like squint and be like, well, maybe this collection of guys will sneak their way to 73 you know, wins. It is so barren, and even though there are reasons to be excited on the offensive side, it's just their their hope. Let alone what the division looks like, as we'll talk about. It is it is a hopeless and and frustrating endeavor to watch. And the overarching issue is that this front office, this ownership group, is not incentivized to win. Because shout out to the people of Denver; these fans show up whether the team is good or the team is bad. Uh, I believe someone once described Coors Field as a beer garden with a ball field. They put butts in seats and print money whether they're winning 60 games or whether they're winning 100 games. What that means is ownership has no real reason to reshuffle the front office that has fallen so far behind the curve. Yeah. And while I, I agree with what you're getting at, I think the other issue is just how insulated this whole operation has been. And I think that you know, the Monforts and, and Bill Schmidt, who, you know, guys who've been in this organization forever, it's not that they don't want to win. It's that they've just, they're existing on, I mean, truly isolationist in terms of just the ballpark situation and, and the context that they're trying to succeed in, but also in just the way they've gone about their business, the way that they've kept everything internal, the way that they haven't advanced 
uh, just so many of their processes, whether it's analytics, like all these things have just not happened. They have not progressed in the right direction. So I do believe that they are upset about being bad, but they are they do not seem to have the capabilities to make the changes to do it. And what's frustrating from a neutral observer standpoint is, let alone for Rockies fans, because I remember just being in Colorado for the All-Star Game a few years ago, like there are very real Rockies fans. It's not just the oh, people yeah. showing up to drink. Like they, they, they're they real fans of this franchise that are just, it's it sucks. It's, it's really disappointing and disheartening to know that there's so little hope about how they can kind of get out of this on top of the challenges that already exist, which is why I hope at some point, I don't know how it's going to happen. We do see a front office, an interesting group of front office people try and tackle this in a very creative way. Cause thus far, there's just no. they haven't given us reason to believe they're going to they're going to find their way out of this. We had the Rockies 30 out of 30 on our young talent rankings. I would also have them 30 out of 30 if I was ranking like. Five year, 10 year outlook, the combination yeah. of a front office that doesn't know what it's doing and a division that's stacked like I just have no faith in this team being a real contender in the years to come. And that includes this season. So let's get to our key players. What, like, who are the players that need to get better in order for there to be hope? I'll kick it to you first, Jordan. Yeah, I mean, again, I, I'll, I'm, I'm not even going to touch the pitching because while there are some interesting and talented arms in the minors, like they're so far away from having a competent pitching staff that I just can't take it seriously from that standpoint. However, on offense, I mean, Nolan Jones was one of the best rookies in baseball last year. Like, that is a legitimate find. And he is incredible. Like, Nolan Jones is awesome. But as far as key players for the... I, I trust in Nolan Jones. Like, I, I, he's proven what he needs to prove. So I'm not worried about him. Tovar, Ezekiel Tovar, the shortstop, is a lot more interesting. Is he the franchise shortstop? They have some other guys coming up in the system that you could imagine maybe taking that job. Tovar is a very, very good defender. He had some good counting stats that were obviously somewhat cores related. But he's 22, right? Like, if he can develop a little bit more as a hitter... And you have an awesome shortstop who can hit like that's not a bad place to start. I mean, there are a lot of teams that don't <laughs> as crazy as it sounds, you know, would love to have Ezekiel Tovar right now. The Dodgers, <laughs> right? Like there's yeah. there are situations <laughs> where like th th this is one example where it's like they have something and they have done a pretty good job scouting hitters and developing hitters, even if you adjust for cores. So they have that going for them. But again, until they can get outs, it just doesn't matter. For me, we need to see something on the pitching side. I'm going to go with Cal Quantrill. The Rockies took Nolan Jones last year after the Guardians jettisoned him and turned him into a real good player or helped him blossom. I'm curious if they can do the same thing with Quantrill. Like Quantrill, 2021 and 2022, 336 innings, 54 starts, an ERA plus of 127. He was a very good very reliable, dependable starting pitcher for the Guardians. He started game three of a playoff series. Like, this is this was a real guy, a real piece. He took a huge step backwards this year. Rockies picked him up. I'm curious if they can get anything out of him. Just, we've rarely seen the Rockies find, like, scrap heap pitchers that they have helped get better, right? And the only example is, like, Daniel Bard, which is such a bizarre case that it's hard to say it's anything repeatable. Let's move on to the thing that makes us laugh. So besides like everything the Rockies do, which is funny, I'm both laughing and crying at Chris Bryant mm -hmm. because Chris Bryant's comments over the winter that he like, I'm paraphrasing here, should have looked more into the Rockies farm system before he signed there or, you know, researched more about the young players they had was like, okay, first of all, dog, like you were advised on the situation and you knew what you were doing when you got into this. Yeah, I don't think he should have. I mean, okay, I'm not saying he should have any regrets. Like the Rockies were offering him an absurd amount of money. Like I understand why he took this contract. Like, sometimes this is just how free agency shakes out. I know the the story you're referring to that Sam Blum wrote was really interesting. Like Bryant was very reflective on this. And it seems like now he's transitioning to a phase where it's like, and right, is this is this funny? Is this sad? Is this kind of cool that like he's like listen i've I, he he knows he's already accomplished everything there is to accomplish. he accomplished everything there is to accomplish in baseball in like three years and so yeah. now what he wants to do is not be an embarrassment he wants to be a good baseball player and he wants to enjoy playing and and we i've made this comparison before between him and rendon right like chris bryant loves ball 
you know, he might know he's about to lose 100 games a bunch over the next, you know, rest of his contract, but he still enjoys playing baseball and wants to prove to everybody, I'm still Chris Bryant. I can still be an all-star, right? The fact that he's now playing first base is like, again, why we were all skeptical of this contract to begin with, but I'm rooting for the guy. I mean, yeah. I know it's kind of a weird situation, but. But what's ahead. funny to me is him being like, man, I should have looked at this apartment before I bought it. <laughs> you know, there were, yeah. it, it wasn't exactly, you know, there were leaks everywhere and the yeah, floorboards yeah, I, were creaky. Again, I, I don't want to, not that I, I think Sam's story was great, but I, I, I feel like that part of it was was not, I, I, I understand why that came out because yeah. that sentiment was clearly communicated, but um. I agree. Now, I will say, conversely, the, the, I'll just say the funny part is Charlie Blackman is just an amazing baseball thing that we have. Um, still there. I, like, he's still, for them to bring him back for, he's making, <laughs> like, they gave him, a what was it, another $13 million? If Charlie Blackman was a free agent, I mean, look at the market. You think Charlie, you think anyone was going to give Charlie Blackman $13 million? <laughs> that is, that is, there is no way. There's no, and I love Charlie Blackman, but that is a great example of, they were like, we need Charlie Blackman here because this is an entertainment business. Is the opposite of the Reds keeping Joey Votto around because they're like, listen, like we, we got room for him. He's not that bad, and everybody loves him, and he loves it here. So what's the difference? Let's have Charlie. He Blackman was like for this, million. He dollars. was like only a little bit better than Votto last year, and he got <laughs> and he thirteen million. And Votto is going to play for the Buffalo Bisons. Jordan, the over under for the Rockies is sixty and a half. What say you? Uh, I'm going over. I know that sounds me nuts. too. Yeah, I'm going Heck over. Yeah. I, again, they were so bad last year, and they could be even worse this year. But like, I still think the Rockies could flip their way into you know sixty one wins. <laughs> sixty is like no wins. That's like so low. Well, I watched had, a lot of the Orioles, but they had, there were years, you know, yeah, fifty nine last year, and the division is better. So maybe this is stupid, but eh, there you go, Rockies fans. We're ending on a positive note. Okay, Jake. As we transition to our next team, I think it's important to acknowledge the order that we're going in because. We've been doing this, uh, you know, worst to first based on the over-unders. However, the Padres and Giants at the lines we are currently looking at both sit at 81 and a half, at least according to BetMGM. Now, the projections have the Giants a little bit better than the Padres as things stand. So let's talk about the San Diego Padres. Okay, what happened last year? This is its own podcast. What the hell happened to the 2023 San Diego Padres? That is, again, but what we do know is that it was one of the most disappointing seasons in recent memory. Sure, they finished at 82 and 80, just like the Yankees, um, but they spent a whole lot of money to get there. And when you consider yeah. the, the talent on the roster, which unlike the Yankees, was not injured. They played. They played all, you know, Soto played 162. Bogarts played 155. Hassan Kim 152. Machado 138. The whole rotation. Blake Snell wins the Cy Young, right? Lugo's awesome. I know Darvish and Walker a little bit hurt. Musgrove was hurt. A That's lot one. went well. A lot went well, or at least a lot seemingly well. Josh Hader, right? He was one of the best players. And they just stunk. <laughs> and it was, you know what it was? You know what it was? Yeah. It was those fans that made the That's What's In song during yeah. the 2022 Listen, NLCS against the Phillies. People feel pretty strongly that that contributed pretty heavily uh, yeah. to their to their down season. Um, this is very simple. Every, it, it, one, the vibes were terrible. The pressure, I, I say, got to them. The, there was disconnect between the front office, the, the, the coaching staff. The manager, everything was wrong, and they got absurdly unlucky. I mean, they had yeah. still, I think, a plus, like, a hundred run differential. <laughs> like, they still, there were still signs that this wasn't a bad team, and yet, yeah. boy, did they look it. I've never seen a better argument that vibes matter in the history of baseball. The vibes were abhorrent, and the team underperformed, and it's not one-to-one -one that simple, but you cannot tell me having watched any of the 2023 Padres, that the energy in a room makes no difference. I have never believed it more than after following that team. And what they do over the offseason, uh, they became the second team in baseball history to trade away Juan Soto, Okay, joining the Nationals. They are now the only two teams to accomplish such a feat. They sent Soto to the Yankees, uh, getting out from under his massive uh, final year of arbitration in order to uh, get the payroll to a more manageable level. They finished last year at $255 million. They entered this year at $160 million projected. Some of that likely has to do with the unfortunate death of owner um, Peter Seidler, 
who passed away over the winter. But that $160 million payroll is kind of the story of their winter. In return for Soto, they did get a lot of controllable young starting pitching that's going to help the team this year. But the offense is less formidable. And there are some obvious holes in this lineup that you would imagine could easily be filled by just a simple dip into free agency. Why is Brandon Belt or J.D. Martinez not on the Padres? Great example. But let's go through the lineup. Yeah. Tommy Pham, yeah. catcher. Luis Camposano, who I actually like and I think is going to be pretty solid this year. He's still only 25. I'm excited that they're going to give him run of the show. He'll be backed up by Kyle Higashioka, who they got in the Juan Soto trade. Jake Cronenworth will be the everyday first baseman. Xander Bogarts <clears throat> will be playing second base. Before Mookie Betts and Gavin Lux switch spots, this was a big story because at shortstop will be Hassan Kim, who was the second baseman last year. Manny Machado will play at third. The outfield. Okay, this is weird. Fernando Tatis Jr., platinum glove right fielder. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Center field, Jackson Merrill, who has never played a game in the big leagues, has had an amazing camp, top prospect, made the team, and looks like he's just going to be the everyday center fielder moving forward for now. And left field is Jerickson Profar and Brad Miller. DH is Graham Pauly, uh, a prospect for them. Uh, again, like I like Grandpa, like go sign Brandon Belt. Uh, the starting rotation is Joe Musgrove, Hugh Darvish, Michael King, Johnny Brito, Vandy, Randy Vasquez, and probably Drew Thorpe at some point. That is one, two, three, four guys they got from the Yankees. The bullpen is Robert Suarez, Yuki Matsui, and Wandy Peralta. Jordan Schusterman, what is your one big question for the 2024 at San Diego Father Figures? I mean, this outfield situation is, is is patently absurd. I know you mentioned Brad Miller. He's an NRI. I mean, I could see, you know, Jose Azokar is a guy we saw get some run last year. He could see some time in center field. I mean, let's just talk about Jackson Merrill. Now, do we know 100 million percent that he is going to be the open day center fielder? Not quite, but it seems that it is trending in that direction based on Mike Schultz comments yesterday. <laughs> I just love seeing a quote. Jackson Merrill is going to Korea. I was like, this is something... <laughs> I, I I know what it means. That he's going to go play the Soul Series, but I just saw that. I was like, "What? A, baseball is a funny sport." We're we're in a it's very like a warped season. version of American Idol, <laughs> right? He like well, walks also, in, they hand also, him a ticket. Normally, like, oh, he's going to Korea. All right, he's going to go to the KBO. Like, I guess he didn't wasn't able to find a major league job. Like, no, no, no. He's he's actually going to yeah. go be the starting center fielder at age twenty. I'm wearing my Fort Wayne Tin Caps hat today because Jackson Merrill started last season with the Tin Caps, in high A, has never played in AAA, had never played center field in his life ever before four days ago, like a week ago, I think. And this is just an all-time <laughs> A.J. Preller masterclass of aggressive prospect maneuvering where it's like, listen, I don't care if he's ever played this position. If he's one of our best nine players. We're going to find a way into the into the lineup. And they have, as many people point out, just as a J.J. Cooper, they are – Attempting to trot out an all shortstop lineup across the entire field, which is very, very impressive. Oh, you're right. Profar, former shortstop, Profar, Merrill, Merrill, shortstop, yep. Tatis, mm-hmm. Cronenworth, Machado. Kim, Machado. That's yeah. amazing. Yes, yes. That's so great. It's the, Why don't we can, build the whole plane out of shortstop? Again, that's that's uh, it's not it's not you, a horrible strategy. You know, AJ Preller thinks a prospect is good if he doesn't trade them away. Um, and so the fact that Jackson Merrill is just like still around at all. But, oh, <laughs> true. Yes. No, that he was like an untouchable is is is, is kind of wild. But that is my big question. It's just like, how does this outfield shake out? Right. Or, or beyond Tatis. And and honestly, it's just like beyond that top five of the lineup. Bogarts, Tatis, Cronenworth, Machado, Kim, like those are the locks of just like what we know are going to be part of this team because they're all making a lot of money. I know Kim's entering his last year. How does that offense shake out and how does that defense shake yeah. out for that matter? And for that reason, I'm actually going to pick Jackson Merrill as my key player. Like you're throwing a 20 year old kid who's never appeared in the big leagues and has never played center field as the everyday center, center fielder, opening day center fielder for a team that's going to try and win a divi- like win a wild card spot. Right. Compete for a division. That's nuts. It's a lot of pressure. Uh, the sense I get from Merrill, like watching interviews that he's done, he's not going to be particularly faced by this he is a oh, mature yeah. beyond his years type guy the pride of Severna Park Maryland yeah. uh, so he's my key player for the Padres who do you have Jordan yeah I mean I think you know we're gonna shout at you Darvish like 
I mean, this is another massive storyline. This team rep- replacing so many innings from last year and getting really creative doing it. When you look at kind of the guys they brought in, you know, Darvish and Musgrove at the top, but King, Brito, we have the knuckleballer, Matt Waldron. How much are we going to see of him? Um, I think I'm going to go with Michael King because for him to be, you know, the centerpiece of that deal from a from a pitching talent standpoint, I know the depth guys, I like Vasquez, I like Brito, Thorpe maybe down the line, but this year, like, this is a bet that what Michael King showed in the second half is for real. And I don't doubt the talent. I'm a little bit worried about the bulk and expecting Michael King to give them even 150 innings, let alone more than that. Uh, but I think what he looked like as a starter was was pretty compelling. But it's it's just going to make such a big difference because beyond them, it's as far as proven major league success with Brito and Waldron and Vasquez and Thorpe. Like you just don't really have that. So this pitching staff just looks so dramatically different, and I think that is, of course, going to be another massively important uh, part of the season. But it's this team is fascinating. I mean, the, the, we're barely yeah. even touching on the Bogart situation or the Kim situation or Tatis. How good is he really offensively? How good Machado? Like, there's so many things with this team that we could get into. We're going we're gonna to temper it. I have a feeling we'll be talking about them playing during the season. Something that makes me laugh, or at least makes me curious, this was a vibe murder last year. This was just an energy vampire situation. And their plan to reshuffle the energy is to bring in Mike Schilt, okay, as their coach, as their manager, as their skipper. And, like, I like Mike Schilt. I'm high on Mike Schilt. They really like Mike Schilt. But he does not really come across as the type of dude who's like, woohoo, like, let's, now we're, now we're bopping. Again, it's a fascinating choice. And I think there's a lot of responsibility on Schilt's shoulders to shift the energy. Yeah, I agree with that. I will say, though, like, seeing his kind of personality shine a little bit more in a way that I feel like he probably didn't think he could ever do in St. Louis. Yes. Yes, great point. Is is I agree. I think that him as a manager and like what he cares about is probably going to be pretty, you know, uptight and not necessarily in a bad way. But he's he's telling some goofy jokes <laughs> in a way that again, like, is and, and has he's this really awkward and kind of hilarious, unintentionally hilarious laugh. <laughs> I yeah. just would encourage um, people to just check out some of the Mike Schultz, you know, interviews during spring training because he's he's shown a little bit more personality. I'm buying Mike Schultz. This year, I think that the cardinal way smothered him a little bit. And the the um, he was born. I mean, he was. That's that's, what I'm saying. He was molded by it. Molded by the cardinal's (laughs) way. Uh, I think that now that he's out from that environment, I think he's going to let his freak flag fly a little bit more. (laughs) I hope so, man. And we'll see a different Mike Schell. Over under is 81 and a half. I'm hammering the over. I'm on. Oh, my, man. I'm like. I, I can't believe I'm doing this again. I'm on like Padres postseason team again. I, I want to sure. stop myself. I want no, someone I mean, to run it, into my room me, and tackle to me. me. The the pitching could capitulate in a pretty epic way. Um injuries why like I am concerned. I, I don't I do not trust this pitching staff, but it just Blake cannot, Snell is still it, out there. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> but I just and, and by the way, we should mention like they're in the cease conversations too. So we'll see if that goes anywhere. I, I, I'm taking the over. I don't know if I'm there about postseason yet, but I, I it just cannot. I mean, think about it. Everything went wrong last year, right? And they won 82 yeah. games. Okay. I know you could argue that they don't have one soda and Blake Snell. I get that. Okay. But there's still a lot of good baseball players on this team. I'm taking the over as well. What I'm rooting for is like the Fernando Tatis Jr. Like return, like the full return. MLB, I don't know if you saw there. He was, he's in this like Corona ad right now like him and Nick Castellanos and I do think that that is somewhat notable because like when Cano got popped right he was not forward facing as much as he well, was before he was he, st- he was a different <laughs> he thing wasn't, and he was bad well I'm talking yeah. about the first time right like the first yeah, time with the yeah, Mariners yeah, yeah, yeah. I always find it fascinating when guys are suspended for PEDs how do they regain popularity or respect within the community and the sense that I get, like, I'm biased, right? Like, talk, like my Little League kids still like Tatis, right? And so I am. Oh, yeah. I am encouraged that we are seeing him re, 
like promoted as one of the faces of the sport. And I hope he's able to kind of really refurbish his image as we move forward. To that, I just want to say we will acknowledge the Noel V. Marte suspension during the NL Central preview. Let's go to the uh, San Francisco Giants. Again, their over-under is also 81 and a half. But uh, boy, they had a, a, an interesting offseason once again. Uh, what did they do last year? Well, they were they were mid in a far less dramatic way. Uh, this team was an absolute snooze fest in 2023. They won 79 games and they decided, uh, okay, that's the end of Gabe Kapler. We're going to move on from him. And we have big ambitions once again going into the winter. Oh, we're going to chase Otani. We're going to chase Yamamoto. We're going to go after all these big guys. And I think I got to say, yeah. I think the Blue Jays, we tried Otani banner overshadows a really hard fought. We tried performance from the San Francisco Giants. <laughs> I agree. However, to, to the Giants credit, they ended up with way more good baseball players than the Blue Jays. I'm not saying they're better than the Blue Jays, but I still think they had a very, very, very strong offseason of course, begun with the uh, signing of Jung Hoo Lee uh, to a massive contract far beyond what anyone expected the KBO superstar to get. But he will be their center fielder and their leadoff guard. They also bring in Jorge Soler. They bring in Matt Chapman very recently. They uh, bring in Jordan Hicks to be a starter. Very weird. Uh, but they they got better. They signed good baseball players. How they fit, we'll see. Tom Murphy, their backup catcher now. I think they got a lot better. But how much better? Who else is on this team, Jim? Well, I have an unhinged, irresponsible question for you. Oh, great. Love Wins this. above replacement over the next, let's say, two seasons. Okay. Matt Chapman plus Jung Hoo Lee plus Jorge Soler or Shohei Otani. How many seasons? Two, like this year and next year. Oh, but, the, but the Giants, not even close. I mean, Otani's not even pitching this year, so... I mean, I, I feel pretty – that's – I mean, let's go farther. Let's do length of the freaking Otani contract. <laughs> I mean, you're saying Solaire plus Lee plus Chapman? I mean, Chapman is a war machine even when his, his streaky hitting. So, um, yeah, unhinged. That was unhinged. Uh, here's who's on the, the – no, The reason the I, I kept it short <laughs> – just the reason yeah. I kept it short is because Chapman yeah. does have an opt-out after the season mm. if, he, if he pops. Oh, okay, specifically uh, for the Giants. Yeah, okay. Right. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's a dumb question. And it makes a bad point, but something to chew on. Uh, who's on this team? Behind the dish is going to be Patrick Bailey, who was really interesting last year. Defensively elite at throwing out runners, not the best framer in the world. Did not hit as much as you'd like. He needs to show a little bit more with the stick. First base is going to be Lamont Wade, probably a little bit of Wilmer Flores against left-handed pitching. Second base, Tyro Estrada, one of the more underrated players in baseball. He's like, very good. Very good he's player. like legit good. Uh, third base is Matt Chapman. Shortstop heading into camp was supposed to be Marco Luciano. However, he has been pretty butt, and it looks like Nick Ahmed from the death, like from the grave, rising up like a phoenix to take this job, rising up from phoenix like a phoenix uh, uh, to take this job. <laughs> Why this couldn't have just been Brandon Crawford, I don't know. Uh, it is so bizarre. But well, I guess Nick Ahmed, who has well, not been good for a long time. I'm sorry. We just need to stick on this for a second because, right, the Crawford point is obvious. And the reporting around it is that they told Brandon Crawford, like Brandon Crawford is like, he knows, he's Brandon Crawford said, I know I am not an everyday shortstop anymore. I just want to be a bench player. And they basically decided we can have more valuable bench players like Tyler Fitzgerald who can actually run and maybe play the outfield and do other things. We didn't want to have Crawford back. And so if they're really going to run out Nick Ahmed on opening day... It's just what an it's so bizarre is and and again speaks really about Luciano and for you know not necessarily in the best way. I would have signed Tim Anderson, but that's just mm. me. The outfield Jung Hu Lee in center field. He is flanked by Mike Yastrzemski, baby Yaz, who must be like one of the longest tender giants now. Uh, and Michael Conforto in the other corner. He's still on this team. Jorge Soler is gonna DH the rotation. Logan Webb, like awesome. One of our we favorite players Webb. in baseball. Mm. Future uh, podcast guest. Logan Webb, Kyle Harrison, top prospect that we're high on. Jordan Hicks, who they're converting to the rotation. Keaton Wynn, who is like sleeper. I like Keaton Wynn. I, he's kind of hurt right now, but I'm, I'm in on yeah. Keaton Wynn. Alex Cobb, whenever he gets back uh, from Robbie Ray. IL. Robbie Ray, whenever his TJ rehab is done. And then Mason Black looks like he's going to snag the fifth spot out of camp. Underrated bullpen, Camilo Duvall, super fun pitcher to watch. 
both Rogers are still on this team, Tyler and Taylor, just a crime. Like their parents going Tyler and Taylor. I've said this before. They couldn't have been like Bob and John or you no know, Tyler and Ken. Like it's just uncool. No, and then I love Luke it. Jackson is back. My favorite little tidbit about this team, Jordan, is Jorge Soler has more World Series rings than the rest of the roster combined. Mm-hmm. But you're bringing that up because Luke Jackson has one too. Uh, <laughs> he's the only other person with one. <laughs> with uh, the one with big, Atlanta, with Soler. Which he got with Atlanta. Mm-hmm. Uh, the one big question with this team, do any of the young guys take a step up and prove themselves as the next like homegrown core for the Giants? Yeah, and so we, we wrote a little bit about this uh, for the Giants. I guess this hasn't published yet. Uh, but we are, you know, we're doing our young talent rankings, our 26 and under, and, you know, writing about the Giants. That is the real question, because while we started to see this next wave of Patrick Bailey and Casey Schmidt, Luis Matos, who's had a nice spring, and Luciano, who was super hype, they all have, and now Bailey's fine because he's a great defensive catcher. So he's going to be the guy, right? He'll be the catcher, and that's fine. But they all have some red flag. I mean, can Schmidt hit it all? Can Luciano play enough defense and then have his bat translate? They've relied so heavily on veterans, both when they were amazing, inexplicably amazing in 2021, and then, you know, over the last few years when they've been average. Who is that young guy? Now, we have to put young, uh, young Lee in here, too, right? I mean, he's he's a part of this, too. He's only 25, and while he had a lot of success in the KBO, he's a rookie, right? And so we don't really know what it looks like at the major league level yet. But I agree. I, that's that's the big question. And you can apply that to the pitching side, too. You know, we're high on Kyle Harrison and Keaton Wynn, but... If, if that doesn't go well, like handing Kyle Harrison the, the number two starter job out of camp, like I really believe in that guy. But that's a that's a big bet. That's a that's a huge, you know, kind of work, not just workload, but c- commitment to give to a guy like that. If you really have postseason uh, intentions, it's really hard to be a successful young pitcher in this league. And and, you know, I think Kyle Harrison can do it, but it is it is a lot to put on the young guys. And this front office under Farhan Saidi has not shown an ability to draft and develop homegrown position players. Their starting lineup, none of these players were drafted by drafted or signed by the Giants. Bailey, they all Patrick come Bailey. from, well, I was going to say except Bailey, yeah. but he has yeah. yet to really prove himself to me like as an everyday big leaguer. Yeah. And so that's a huge deal. Matos would be that, right? Um, Schmidt would be that. Luciano would be that. And so... If those guys hit and can make the leap, that portends well for the front office. If none of them do, that's a big red flag for me. Key player, key player for me is Jung Hoo Lee. The fact that he hit an 110 mile per hour exit velocity home run is reassuring because the biggest question mark for him coming over from Korea for six years and 100 and I think 18 mil, like, can he impact the baseball enough to be an impact big leaguer? So, I mean, we won't know for months. We can't tell. But the delta between what this guy could be is enormous, right? He could be a light-hitting, high-average, good center fielder. Or he could be a great defender in center who hits 15 to 20 bombs a year. That's an all-star if he's hitting 295, 300. And so he could either be like the best player on the Giants or he could hit ninth, and we just don't know. Yeah, and and I think the de- the defense component of that, and I just haven't seen nearly enough of him this spring, or even you know watching. I've, I feel like I've watched a lot of him hitting when he was with the with with Kiwum, but uh, the defensive component is really crucial for the overall profile because that will kind of sustain. And, and it's the same thing with Hassan Kim, right? Like we could be patient with Hassan Kim's bat because he was one of the best infield defenders in the world. If Jung Hoo Lee can be a really good defensive center fielder. We could be a lot more patient with the bat, but as far as the you know the Giants going to the postseason, I mean, yeah, he's he's absolutely crucial. And my key player is Jordan Hicks. I mean, this is something one of the one of the more creative and bizarre moves of of, of the offseason was. I think we probably didn't realize that Jordan Hicks was still trying to start, and that he was basically telling teams, "I want to still start." In some ways, it makes sense because Jordan Hicks is only twenty seven, uh, but in other ways, it doesn't make sense because well. We've watched him try and do this multiple times and his stuff. And while his he's added enough pitches to where you think it's possible, the command has been the command for his whole career. And maybe you say, listen, change of scenery. 
Cardinals. And, and that's why I'm somewhat optimistic because the Giants have had success with some interesting yeah. pitching roles and whatnot. Now, I know that's frustrated some of the guys that have been there, like Stripling and Alex Wood and whatever. I'm cautiously optimistic here. At the very least, I'm excited to see him try. I mean, he's obviously a very fun pitcher to watch try and figure this out. And then, yeah, what does it look like when Jordan Hicks is facing a guy for a second or a second time or even third time through the order? I, I have no idea. But in addition to Harrison and Wynn, the young, the young pitchers, all, so many young pitchers that they're going to rely on. And as we mentioned earlier, I'm still watching this team for Snell, you know, for Montgomery. I think Lorenzen even, right? Like these are still options for them if they want to kind of fortify the rotation. But Hicks is just going to be at, at absolute because maybe it just doesn't work and he goes to the bullpen and other bullpen is, is one of the best in baseball. But now you just have a rotation that is, is is very thin. So we'll see. What makes me laugh? Well, this team has lacked power ever since Barry Bonds called it a day. Barry, Barry Bonds, Bonds is uh, he has Bonds. the most home runs in the baseball. Uh, Barry Bonds is the last San Francisco Giant to hit 30 home runs in a season. That was 2007. The last Impossible. right-handed hitter to do it was Jeff Kent. 2004. 2004. Sorry, yeah, he, 2004. He, yeah, Bonds hits 28 in his final <laughs> year in 2007. But 2004, uh, which again is 20 years ago, yeah. uh, they haven't done it. Now, they have two guys, Solaire, Matt Chapman. They could hit 30 home runs, surely. Or, or, or maybe not. What do you think? We want them to both hit 29 home runs. We want good Jorge Soler, good Matt Chapman. Heck, I want this whole team to hit 29 home runs. Yeah. Michael I, Conforto, <laughs> Chung Hoo Lee, Yastrzemski, Logan <laughs> Webb, 29 home runs. 39 home It's like when you are like go to the edge of the map at a video in a video game. It's like this is it's just like an invisible wall. Like, sorry, guys. You can't. 30 home runs is not possible unless you're the greatest hitter of all time. Impossible. <laughs> so, I agree. Um, and then I this is – okay. It's not make sense. I don't know if this is funny, but I just want to acknowledge the J.D. Davis situation. Totally bizarre. And they not, not funny. To me. Not funny. Not funny to me. Not, okay. Well, I guess what is funny, which at J.D. Davis expense, which is not fair because I think J.D. Davis is good, is that Pablo Sandoval lasted on this roster longer than J.D. Davis. That is inexplicable and ridiculous. I know J.D. Davis got like screwed out of $6 million. He's going to sign soon. And I hope he I hope J.D. Davis is awesome this year, wherever he signs. Yeah, it, it's a longer conversation like. There's a, it was a loophole in the CBA. Go read Andrew Baggerly's article about it at The Athletic. It was very good. Over under 81 and a half. Jordan Schusterman. I'm going over. I think them and the Padres, I think this is appropriate that they have the same line. They're going to get there in very different ways. <laughs> but I am probably, now I will say, we've talked about it. The Giants are much more watchable now uh, than they were before. But uh, I'm, I'm, I'm going over here. I'm still not sure who I have ahead, Giants or Padres. But I'm going over also. I'm going to, go over as well by a smidge i think we get logan webb cy young mm. it's it's very possible i mean again, i think he throws of- like 235 innings or something <laughs> outrageous him and matt chapman together like the amount of ground balls to the left side that I chapman mean, is gonna yeah, scoop and, up and again like it's like oh he can't win he doesn't get enough strike but like listen he just has to do what sandy did right Sandy, I mean, yeah. Sandy basically was the blueprint. Sandy threw 228 innings, 228 ERA, you know, less than a strikeout per inning, but a million ground balls and the ERA was down. And it, yeah. it's, it's it's doable. It's Ooh. absolutely doable for him to win it. Actually, I'm going to take that back. Spencer Strider's in the National League. I'm sorry. Okay, let's take a quick break. And when we return, we will talk about the defending National League champion Arizona Diamondbacks. What? And welcome back to Baseball Barbacast. Jake Mintz, Jordan Schusterman. We're alive. So are the snakes, the Arizona Diamondbacks last year, the run of a lifetime. How'd they do? They they almost <laughs> did it, man. They almost did the whole damn thing. Just flying through the National League in October, knocking off the Brewers, the Dodgers, and the Phillies before falling to the Texas Rangers in the World Series. But they kept the good vibes of going over the winter, a very active offseason. For the snakes and the Diamondbacks kept the good times rolling in the offseason with a very active winter. They did not rest on their laurels. They went out. They signed Eduardo Rodriguez, free agent lefty, to a multi-year deal. Brought in Jack Peterson to be the designated hitter and just swing as hard as he can. Traded for third baseman Eugenio Suarez from the from your Seattle Mariners. 
I guess they also signed uh, Randall Grichik. Didn't even realize that. Forgot about that. Yeah, pretty cool. Yes, they did. Uh, that's what they did. Who do they have, Jordan? You want to run us through the lineup? Sure. Uh, behind the dish, one of my favorite players in baseball, Gabriel Moreno. First base, Christian Walker, still underrated. He's had basically identical seasons each of the last two years. Uh, I know he didn't look great at times in October, but still a Yikes. very, very good first baseman. Uh, Cattell Marte, another one of my favorite players. Talk about, he was unbelievable in October. One of the best switch hitters in baseball at second base. Uh, as you mentioned, Suarez over a third. Shortstop, very interesting situation, but it does seem like Geraldo Perdomo will be there again, kind of a breakout last year. Lourdes Gurriel Jr., we should mention, they brought him back, signed him, retained him as a free agent. Alec Thomas in center field, fantastic defensively. Didn't really hit it all in the regular season, hit a little bit uh, in the postseason. Corbin Carroll, sensational. One of the best young players we have in baseball. He will be in right. DH, Jock Peterson, you mentioned him replacing Tommy Pham. How hilarious is that? Uh, bring it in the lefty bat there. I love that fit for Jock. Rotation. Oh, boy. This is looking a lot better than it did a year ago. Zach Gallen, Merrill Kelly, Brandon Fott, another October breakout. Erod, maybe Erod's the two or the three starter. And then the five is, they got a bunch of young guys. Ryan Nelson looking like the five right now, but I could see that uh, being a few different guys as the season goes on. And then in the bullpen, of course, my beloved Paul Seawald. So cool to see him have success on the big stage. And the gink, Kevin Ginkle. The gink. Oh, my the goodness. Gink. What a what a show from him. And uh, the bullpen, I don't have to read it. You watch them storm through October. They're all back. They didn't change a single thing about their bullpen, and we're going to get to that uh, in a second. But let's... Let's do the one big question. One big question is, is maybe not that was it a fluke, but like, let's spin this positively. Is this obviously a postseason team again? Because remember, they were not obviously a postseason team last year. No, I don't no. think so. And I think that's more about the division yep. than anything else. Mm -hmm. I feel good about them, and I think they did enough to like, stay competitive and i think they very well could be a postseason team but i don't think they are a guarantee at all yeah i think i'm there too and their over under is 84 and a half and I, i'm gonna end up taking the under because i can't take the over on every team in the division although <laughs> we'll see with the dodgers <laughs> which will be an interesting one and we'll get to them in a bit um but yeah i i agree with you i just think that they so much went right for them to barely get in. Now, you could project and say, well, it's a better roster than it was a year ago. And I think that that's fair. I don't know. I'm, I, I, it's, it's weird. When I like so many of these players, I, I should be bullish. Maybe I'm a little bit light on maybe. I, I think I'm, I'm definitely rounding down on the rotation, I, I would say, to be honest. As much as I like Zach Allen. I think that's some of my concern is the pitching staff, I would say. Let's think about it from this perspective, right? They won 84 and 78 last year. They're true, like, Pythagorean win loss based upon runs scored and runs allowed 80 and 82. So they outperformed by about four wins. Okay. Are they also 84 wins is probably not going to get you a postseason spot again. Probably not. Right. Probably not. So let's say 86. Is this team six wins better true value than it was last year? I could see it both ways, right? The addition of Erod and more from Brandon fought and the offensive ads they made and maybe Jordan Lawler comes up and is really good but is that six wins I don't know I don't think Merrill Kelly is going to have a 132 ERA plus again like I'll take the under on that yeah I'll take the under on this bullpen probably yeah and so for that reason I will also take the under on 84 wins yeah it's to me I'm I am rounding up on the offense and down on the pitching and the pitching can sink you a lot faster um this offense just wasn't actually that good last year. Uh, and I know there's reasons to think it can be better, but I don't know. I, I, I feel bad. Like I, they, they, may, they, they, they did what you're supposed to do when you, when you have a surprise postseason run, which is, you know, ride that momentum. Um, so maybe we're being haters. Uh, let's do key players uh, before we, before we move on. I'm going to do Corbin Carroll. Like he was amazing. He was everything he was supposed to be. Is he one of the best 10 players in the league? Or is he one of the best 25 players in the league? Now, second it is year will tell us. Second, second year, year will tell us. Tell us. Mm -hmm. It is unfair to say that they need him to be one of the 10 best players in the league to like compete for the division, but it's true. And I think last year, 
we got like a weird down sophomore year from Julio Rodriguez, right? <laughs> but I think that the way that his down year looked made me believe in him for the next five years. And so I am very interested to see what we get from Corbin Carroll. Yep, I think that's fair. I'm going to go with Jordan Lawler. I, it's very similar to what I said about Junior Caminero, but when you have a top prospect that seems close to or already big league ready, but there's no room for him, what does that look like? Um, when does he kind of force his way into the situation, or does he not? And they stick with Perdomo. Is Perdomo overrated after last season? I, I don't really know, but I'm curious how they handle him, how long they wait to kind of bring him up when they think he's ready. Or if he's maybe, I, I mean, I'm, I'm rooting for Jordan Lawler, but maybe he's not a top 10 prospect. Maybe he isn't going to be a future impact player and he kind of fits more on the bench. I just I just don't know what we have with him uh, quite yet. Um, as for something that makes us laugh, like I, I just love that they are riding with this pen again. It, it's a, one of the reasons I'm concerned, but I also respect that they're like, listen, because again, it's not what the Rangers did. <laughs> The Rangers were like, oh, we should probably get some help. And they did, right? They bring in Robertson and Kirby. And so the D-backs were like, no, nah, man, our group is invincible. You can't stop Andrew Saul Frank and Scott McGuff and Ryan Thompson and Joe Mantiplier. Like, we we got our guys. And I know Seawall wasn't there at the start of last season, so that's definitely an upgrade. But um, I'm excited to see this group kind of kind of cook again, hopefully. I, I'm a little worried about it, but it would be cool if they can sustain it. Uh, I'm going to take the under on 84 and a half. Yeah, slight under. I, I listen... This is more about, our, I think, our optimism for San Diego and San Francisco um, and apparently Colorado. <laughs> Smashing that over 60 and a half. <laughs> 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 All right. Uh, I guess we should probably talk about the Dodgers. Huh? We could just do a whole podcast on the Dodgers uh, if yeah. we wanted to. But that yeah. sounds like an yeah, exhausting think, endeavor. Think, think about it this way. We are going to talk about the Dodgers so much this year. So much. I, I really, for this preview, for these next, you know, 10, 15 minutes, I really want to zoom in on, on the recent news. Okay. So let's. Okay. What so, happened last yeah. year? They, they were really good. They won 100 games. They got embarrassed uh, by the Diamondbacks at home. Great. What do they do this offseason? They spent a billion dollars. They got Otani. They got Yamamoto. They bring back Hayward. They trade for Glass now. They signed Tay Oscar. It, on and on. Did I miss any, any obvious things? Okay, great. Great. Dodgers. We've been talking about them nonstop, obviously. Right. Give me their lineup, Jake. Behind the dish, Will Smith and a man who withstands the changing of the times. Austin freaking Barnes is still the backup for the Los Angeles Dodgers. It feels like this team has had like 85 catching prospects like bubble up <laughs> over the last handful of years and they still have them and he has just withstood it all. I am fascinated <laughs> by Austin Barnes. First base, Freddie Freeman. Third base, Max Muncy. Second base, was going to be Mookie Betts, <laughs> but now it's Gavin Lux. Shortstop was going to be Gavin Lux, but now it's Mookie Betts. In the outfield is James Outman, a breakout guy from last year in center. Left is going to be T. Oscar, and right field will be like a Jason Hayward, Chris Taylor, Kike Hernandez situation. I would expect Taylor uh, and Hernandez maybe to get some run in center field as well because Outman is a lefty. Designated hitter, uh, Shohei Otani. Uh, the starting rotation. Wait, what? Yeah, Otani is on the Dodgers, oh and he's God. not going to pitch. What do they so, need him for? All right, sorry. I don't I don't know. Probably the money. <sighs> uh, starting pitchers, Tyler Glass now is going to start on opening day in Korea. Yoshinobu Yamamoto is going to be the two. Bobby Miller, James Paxton, Gavin Stone. He may and then whenever it seems healthy. I know. Good, good James Pax, doesn't he get like a huge bonus if he <laughs> yes. makes the opening day roster? I, think so. I don't know if that he gets like changed, nine million. What is it? He gets like yeah. a million bucks or something. Yeah, it's some some very strange injury guarantee. Yeah, I love that. At some point, Walker Bueller will return. At some point, presumably, Clayton Kershaw will return. Uh, the one weird thing about this team is for all the money they spent on the roster, the bullpen remains a ragtag group of dreamers. Evan Phillips, who was money last year. He's amazing. Joe Kelly. He's been, dude, he's been <laughs> unreal for the last two. He's been one of the best <laughs> believers in baseball. But yes, nobody still nobody knows who he is. So. Evan Phillips, Joe Kelly, who is very famous. People do know him. Ryan Brazier, Alex Vessia, Blake Trinan, Daniel Hudson. Just every other year he ends up on the Dodgers. It's incredible. Ryan Yarbrough, who I think is going to end up starting a bunch of games for this team. Love and yards. then like the... I'm fascinated by the bullpen. Okay. One big question. One big question about the, the Dodgers. Most hyped team in a long time. 
how does this go wrong? Is I want you to paint me the scenario in which the Dodgers don't make the playoffs. Besides, I, mean, I, can't, I can't do that. Besides like an Ebola <laughs> outbreak, okay, <laughs> or like a Space Jam situation, um, how does this go wrong? Without like an a like unprecedented number of injuries um, or illnesses, I guess, uh, they're going to make the playoffs. Now, the over-under is 103.5, which is, I, I assume, the highest that books have ever put out. I mean, maybe the Dodgers have had a high number. I've seen the Astros at or slightly over 100 before in recent years. Braves also, you know, projected they're at 101.5, so is it really that big of a difference? But how does it go wrong? I mean, the reality, and every Dodgers fan will tell you this, is that the regular season and this has been true for a long time, so how different is it really? The regular season is just kind of an enjoyable six-month parade of baseball success. Very relaxed, low stakes, right? Because you know you're going to win 100 games anyway. You have all the best players. You'll Sounds always nice. come back, you know, down by three runs late against against the against the Rockies. Like, And oh, Charlie very... Steiner still can't believe that they are coming back. That's the right, other thing. Right, right. And, and, and Joe Davis having, having a grand old time. Uh, so we have some new characters here. We're going to see Otani, a very important part of the T. Oscar is going to have 30 homers. But for Dodgers fans, none of that matters when October begins. Their offseason, in my mind, doesn't necessarily change the random roulette wheel that is October. It makes it more likely that they win because they have more good players, but it's still a total crapshoot. So to, to, that, to try and answer that, I would say that my cop-out answer is I can't say how it's going to go wrong without knowing who's healthy and who's on the team when October begins. Um, and there's just so many parts of that that we don't know. So let's just zoom in on the, on the big news. Okay. And, and, and really the other answer to this is the defense. Okay. They now Freddie Freeman is an amazing first baseman. So he's probably going to cover up for a lot of uh, bad throws from literally all of his infielders. But, <laughs> But when you consider even Teoscar in left is not necessarily plus. Outman, I think, is fine. He's pretty good in center, whatever. Right field, Hayward's still solid. You know, what, what, what we're getting. Will Smith, decent catcher. But this situation where they have decided that they have just decided not to address the shortstop position um, is, is shocking, honestly. And the way that they've handled this and the way that they are now able to say, Hey Mookie, can you bail us out? Is so absurd for so many reasons yeah. that that I it's it's one of the more ridiculous I, I think storylines that we've had in, in spring training and, and kind of sequences of events that we've had for any team, let alone the team that is expected to be the center of the baseball universe. Can we get like a mini timeline here of how did we get to this point? Right. So it all kind of begins when Gavin Lux has an unfortunate injury last year, where he tears his ACL in spring training. He was supposed to be the starting shortstop last season, right? Right. What ends up happening they, they is they don't bring Trey Turner back, right? So let's start. They don't bring that, Trey right? Turner they back. They don't bring Trey Turner back, and it's like, okay, Lux, Lux, this is going to be the guy now, right? We've we've well, he, we've drafted and developed him. We think we can finally yep. turn it over to him. Instead, his leg goes kablooey, and Miguel Rojas starts 109 games at shortstop, the majority of the games. Lux comes back from injury this spring and is being proclaimed as the shortstop, and that. Pressure seems to has seems to have had gotten to him a little bit. Lux has had issues with the yips with throwing the ball in the infield before. I mean, he but, wasn't considered a plus defender to shortstop anywhere. Really, at any. I mean, honestly, he kind of was as a high schooler. <laughs> it's very interesting because he became but, much more of a bat first prospect. But the combination of coming off <clears throat> coming off an ACL injury, not ever being considered a plus shortstop beforehand. Having a history of the yips, it's not exactly a cocktail for a gold glove. Okay? And, and so yeah. he's come in this spring and he has looked shakier than a wooden bridge. And last week, Dave Roberts was like, eh, nah. <laughs> like a day after he was like, he's our shortstop. Um, again, and that combined with like the fact that they seem to be holding the position for him. You know, and yeah, they have this insurance policy in Rojas, which is very important. And he's going to be playing a lot of shortstop this year, even if it's in the later innings. Still had Taylor clearly didn't trust him there. They bring back Kiki. Like they clearly have all these other insurance plans. 
But to still land on the solution as being Mookie Betts everyday shortstop is obviously, first and foremost, a testament to how much of a freak Mookie Betts is that they're even willing to ask him to do this and that he's willing to take it on. Because respectfully, and Mookie, by the way, did play like 10 games of shortstop last year, so it's not like he hasn't done it at all. But he's very been very open about this. He's like, yeah, this is really a big deal and like a big challenge and I'm excited for it, but like this is this is not a small thing to do and he's right. However, an issue with Mookie at times is like there was a year in there where he kind of just got bored, right? I want to say it was what, 2021? 2021? 2021, he yeah. looked pretty bored. He looked bored as hell. Even and in so, 2022. Yeah. Even in 2022 in which he <laughs> was like was one of the best MVP. players in the world. <laughs> okay, he looked a little bored. And so the idea that he has this new challenge to learn to play shortstop at the big leagues as a 31 year old yes. coming off a runner up finish in the MVP. Like, yes. sure. Mookie's like, all right. Yeah. yeah whatever. Which, dude. Again, it, it speaks to how incredibly gifted he is. I will say though, it is an interesting. Now it's, it's so fascinating for so many reasons because now I'm wondering, okay, but can Lux hit enough to even be a good second? Like I'm still now I want to see if Lux can hit like in it, let alone be a good defensive second baseman. Like I, so I'm worried about, so I'm still concerned about Lux. And then the thinking is with Mookie. This guy has essentially optimized what it is to be a hitter. Um, he hit career high 39 home runs. If you want to drool over a stat cast page, it's his. Okay. His offensive, he is like 99th percentile in not chasing. He's 95th percentile in not swinging and missing. He's elevating the ball to the perfect launch angle. Oh, he is a perfect hitter now, right? And you know who else is? Freddie Freeman. And so, the fact that they're adding Shohei Otani to this is so patently ridiculous, and that is the obvious headline that we'll have all season. But how Mookie's move to shortstop impacts his offense, if at all, will be a fascinating thing to watch as well. I really like Gavin Lux, but I'm a little worried just because it's the equivalent of saying, hey, we don't trust you to drive this truck, but we're going to have you drive this car, and that's going to go totally fine. It's a little less important, uh, but it's 99%. Like, being the shortstop and being the second baseman is like 99% of the same job. It's not like being the shortstop and, you know, working at a grocery store or like being the shortstop <laughs> and being an accountant. Yeah, I think some right? people like, might push is, back on 99% just because there's a reason some people play short and some people play second, no, I, but I, I, do, I know what you're that. getting at. Yes. You get my point. It's not yeah. be a shortstop or be a DH or go yes. to the outfield. Yes, like, yes, yes, yes. it is the same physical job. And so I am a little concerned that he'll be able to do it. Key player, you talked about it. It's Mookie Betts. Can he learn to play shortstop? Tyler Glass now is somehow being overlooked in all of this because this spring, this guy has been comically good. I know you're really high on him. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, again, whether he's you know throwing a two-seamer, uh, reportedly working on that or not, like, I don't care. Like, he was one of the best pitchers in baseball last year. So it's just that surprising. But to see how he's evolved, if at all, or if he just becomes the best version of himself with the Dodgers and for him to start on opening day, which has he done that? I know this sounds like a dumb question. Has Glassdale started on opening day before? I guess I could probably figure that out. But um, for him to get that opening day nod in Korea is, is very cool. And of course, there's there's other you know Dodgers pitchers that are going to be very important. And Yamamoto is the one making you know three times as much as Glassdale even after the extension. Uh, but he, we shouldn't be surprised, right? Yamamoto's is more of a mystery box as much as we believe in him too. He's just awesome, and I'm I'm really excited to see uh, if if he's on on the mound. He's going to be one of the best pitchers in baseball. I have no doubt about it. Glass now has one opening day star. He started in 2021 for Tampa. Uh, the thing that makes us laugh, I mean, it's a 103 Vegas over under. Like that's 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 absurd. That's completely yeah. nuts. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the under on that because yeah. it's 103.5. Uh, I would take the over on 99, yeah. but I'm going to go ahead and take the under on 103.5. I will point out that, again, looking at the projection systems and just like the roster, the Braves it's it's are right there. Like The, it, the projection systems have the Braves actually are more optimistic on the Braves than the Dodgers. So I know there's a lot of injury stuff baked in with, with the Dodgers, uh, for better or for worse. You could view that as a positive or a negative. But um, yeah, I, I'm still taking the the under. But I don't know. <laughs> it's like who would you rather take pulling. to win the World Series, them or the Braves? More likely to win the World Series, the Braves or the Dodgers? I guess Braves slightly, but 
Okay, by the way, let's just also point out, right? So 103 is the number, 103 and a half. They want a 111 in 2022, 106 in 2021, 106 in 2019, 104 in 2017. So, like, it's not like they're only winning 99 or 100. Like, they could no, very comfortably clear this. Yeah. I understand. Yeah. I think that the absurd offseason they <laughs> had, as awesome as it was, I don't think this team is better than the Atlanta Braves. Uh, I think they I might don't. be. But that's fine. I don't. That's fine. I just, I have seen the Braves do this with the exact same group of players for the last three years. And I want the Dodger, like Mookie Betts is going to be the shortstop. Max Muncy is not a great defensive third baseman and Gavin Lux I don't know what we're getting at second. And so Yeah, but 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 I, again. I know again. they have Shohei Otani, <laughs> Mookie Betts, and Freddie Freeman in an incredible rotation. I understand that. I'm not <laughs> sitting here saying that the Braves are gonna win I'm not correcting you know, you. 103 so games and the Dodgers are gonna win 71. I just said if you made me choose between the two, which I made me choose between the two. I would take the Braves. That's enough. Jordan Schusterman. Oh, what a funny way to end. Dodgers waited all the whole episode for you to tell them the Braves are better. Uh, we are done Not with the by RNL a West, lot. Not <laughs> with by RNL a West lot. review. We will be doing the AL West on Friday and then I believe the NL East on Monday when at the end of the Braves segment, I'll say the Dodgers are better <laughs> just to balance it out. Um, we have a very, very cool bonus podcast coming tomorrow. Uh, I'm very excited about that. I'm not even going to spoil it, but it's going to be awesome. So stay tuned for that. Uh, And then, of course, you guys will preview the AL West on Friday. One last bit of housekeeping. We are going to do a fantasy league with Barbacast listeners. Uh, You can email us at baseballbarbacast at gmail.com. That's B-A-R-B-Cast. Let us know why you want to be in the league. Again, we are going to find a time. This will, of course, we will be doing this on Yahoo. You should sign up for uh, Fantasy Baseball on Yahoo right now, yahoo.com slash Fantasy Baseball, Yahoo Fantasy app, fantastic. That is where the league will be housed. How many teams are in the league? TBD. When we're going to be drafting? TBD. But what, what's going to happen is we're going to pick a time before opening day, probably after the Korean series, to be honest, although I guess we'll see. And if you can make it, let us know, baseballbarbercast.gmail.com, and we will uh, randomly select uh, some lucky members to join our league with us. Do you think we can get J- uh, Jeff Luna out of being in the league with us? Uh, he's busy with his uh, soccer teams, um, but interesting. Uh, maybe he doesn't have anything else going on, but uh, I don't think we want that, that personality in our fantasy league, which is going to be full thought. of upstanding individuals. Uh, thank you all for listening to this edition of Baseball Barbacast. Thank you to Andrew Hartz, Hartz the producer, and Brett Rader, of course, for supervising and making sure this podcast happens. We really appreciate it, and uh, we'll be back tomorrow. Ooh, back tomorrow. Here's... Here's the hot take everyone really wanted. The Dodgers are a bunch of overrated bums, and the Atlanta Braves are the true kings of the National League. Everyone knows I'm a Braves homer. Um, so there you go. That's what you were looking for. Have a great Flip that. day. Flip that. Bye. Flip that. Bye. <laughs>